Homerus swallowtail can only be found in Jamaica in two separate areas. One in the eastern end of the island in the Blue Mountain and John Crow Mountain chains and the other in the cockpit country in western central Jamaica. Homerus is both the largest and most distinctive butterfly in the New World. In the eastern population, adults fly in contiguous wet primary rainforest and primary forest margins at the confluence of the Blue and John Crow mountain chains. Much of the primary forest in this area has been destroyed by human disturbance and hurricanes have further damaged the area. Rainfall in these forests normally exceeds 250 centimetres and may reach 700 centimetres per year. The heaviest rains occur in May and June and again from August to November. The major dry season is from January to March. A butterfly appears to require quite wet sites with heavy rainfall because it has been observed that the immature stages cannot survive in areas where the humidity is less than or close to 100%. The forest contains many tree species together with tree ferns, epiphytes, lianas, aroids and bromeliads. Forest margins contain invasive species such as bamboo and bananas. Not long after sunrise, adults make a short flight from their overnight resting places to a nearby sunlit leaf. For 30 minutes or so, they will sit with their wings spread out flat to warm up in the sunshine before setting off on their daily activities. Males are extremely active on sunny days flying lazily over streams and through the forest. Courtship involves the males flying in rapid, tightly circulating flights with females under the forest canopy prior to the initiation of mating, which may last for more than one hour. Once fertilized, females actively search out the large leaves of Hernandia catalpifolia, a short, spreading tree. Eggs are laid singly on the upper side of the lower leaves of larger trees, as well as on saplings. Newly laid eggs are spherical and light green in colour, but they change to a darker brown before the larva emerges, which is approximately eight days after oviposition. We were lucky enough to film a female ovipositing on the leaves of the food plant as shown in this sequence. Recent research at the University of the West Indies has shown that up to 76% of all of the eggs that are deposited are attacked and killed by three species of tiny parasitic wasps. One of these wasps is shown near a homerous egg in this sequence. Here again a parasitic wasp moves around between homerous eggs in search of a new egg to attack. These wasps insert their egg into the homerous egg and the wasp larva consumes the homerous egg contents before emerging as a new adult. Once the new wasp emerges, the homerous egg is left behind as an empty shell. First instar homerus larvae hatch from the eggs that successfully develop. Newly emerged larvae are shown here on the leaves of the food plant. They have consumed part of their eggshells, but the basal sections remain attached to the leaf. The anterior end of this larva is initially brown, becoming black except for the posterior two segments, which are white. It has very prominent scoli, or tubercles bearing spines on all of the three thoracic segments and the first abdominal segment. 
When fully grown, the first instar larvae are 12 millimetres or half an inch long. The larva molts to the second instar, which basically retains the same coloration. Most of the major scoli are reduced to tubercles, and lateral tubercles on the swollen third thoracic segment become prominent, later forming false eye spots. The beginning of a white abdominal saddle marking is also becoming apparent. The coloration of the third instar is similar to that of the second instar. The scoli are lost and the tubercles on the swollen third thoracic segment become more prominent as false eye spots as the larva grows to a length of 2.5 centimetres. The white saddle marking on the dorsal abdominal area also becomes more extensive and the terminal segments remain pure white. The head is small and pale brown in colour. It is somewhat hidden below the anterior thoracic segments. Fourth and fifth instar larvae are similar in colour, but the colours on the fourth instar are distinctly paler than those on the fifth. Areas that were white in the earlier instars turn light green in the later instars. The thoracic segments and the first abdominal segment are greatly enlarged at this stage and there is a white band with blue spots crossing the dorsal region of the last thoracic segment. In front of this white band is a mottled light and dark brown band that crosses the segment, terminating in brown lateral tubercles edged with blue and forming the false eye spots. In the abdomen, a grey-brown cross-shaped dorsal saddle marking contains a few blue spots and a roughly diamond-shaped green lateral marking. When attacked or abruptly disturbed, these larvae may extrude brick-red osmeteria from the anterior region just behind the head. The osmeteria are found in all larval instars and may emit a musty smell when extended. The fierce looking eye spots on the front of the body give a false impression that the head is very large and the animal is dangerous to its would-be predators. In actual fact the true head is very small and it can be retracted and concealed inside the enlarged body segments. It is this retracted condition that the larva assumes when it is at rest. Larvae tend to alternate between feeding and resting periods, which occur both in the daytime and throughout the night. Quite often, the portion of the leaf furthest from the stem is consumed on both sides of the midrib, thus making a V-shaped notch in the leaf. Eventually, all of the leaf is consumed by the seemingly never-ending removal of tiny slivers at each bite. Food plants with half-eaten leaves are much more easily spotted than hunting for individual larvae. As the larvae grow to over 70 millimetres long when fully mature, they become heavy and it becomes more difficult for them to cling onto the slippery leaf surface. Windy conditions further add to this problem. To overcome this, they spin a web of silken threads over the area of the leaf on which they rest. Legs are then used to grip this silken web and it is extremely difficult to remove the larva from the leaf surface. As well as feeding on the leaf, the larva actually drinks droplets of rainwater that periodically fall on them. The back and forth motion of the head of this larva indicates that it is picking up the moisture on the leaf surface. Here, 
a droplet of rainwater is rapidly consumed. Larvae actively move around on the stem of the plant in a shambling motion typical of so many caterpillars. When they are fully fed, the larvae move onto the stems of the food plant in search of a suitable place to pupate. Having found a suitable stem, the larva uses the silk glands in its head region to spin a small silk pad on the branch. It then grips this pad firmly with the claspers on the posterior end of the body. The process of spinning the girdle then begins, with the larva spinning successive silken threads in the shape of a hoop attached at both ends to the plant. At first, this hoop is held between the forelegs and the head of the larva as it spins successive threads. When about 15 threads have been completed, the larva slips its head through the girdle and uses it to suspend itself from the plant. Whilst this process is going on, the colour of the larva slowly darkens. Eventually, the larva depends entirely on the girdle and the tiny silk pad to remain attached to the plant. Slowly, the rest of the legs lose their grip on the stem, and the larva becomes very, very dark. Finally, the old larval skin is shed, revealing the immobile pupil stage. Although from the exterior there is an apparent inactivity and a total lack of feeding in this stage, inside the pupa all the body structures of the old larva are being broken down and reorganized into the shape of the adult insect. This process requires several weeks to complete and finally a new adult emerges from the pupil skin. It begins to stretch out its shriveled wings and dry them in the sunshine. Once the wings have hardened and dried, the new adult takes flight in search of its food, which is the nectar from several types of flowers. Also, it sets out in search of a mate in order to once again go through the breeding cycle. Conservation measures to protect this butterfly from imminent extinction are urgently needed. It would certainly be a great loss both to Jamaica and the rest of the world if this magnificent butterfly were allowed to become extinct in the near future. Only the few pin specimens in museums around the world would be left to show that it ever existed at all. <laughs>